Who does? Okay, so good morning, everyone. My name is Jesse Hildebrand, and I am with Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. For those who don't know, who have never joined us before, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. Uh, I'm really excited today because today is part of our Space Week celebration. So we've had a full week of astronauts, explorers, science communicators, photographers, a little bit of everything. It's been marvelous. I know a few of you classes might have joined us before, which is just great. Uh, right now, we're joined by five classes from across North America. So I'm going to give them a chance to do a bit of a shout out. We have got Mrs. McCrell's grade four from Herndon, Virginia. Wherever they are. There we go. We got it. Hi, guys. <laughs> We've got Mr. Jenkins' is grade five from Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Oh, they don't like us. Yeah. We do like you. We promise. Yeah. All right. <laughs> we've got uh, Isaac Brock Public School. I'm not sure if their mic's working, but we've got a group uh, grade. What do we got from Isaac Brock? Grade sixes from Brampton. We've got Mrs. Dykeson's uh, grade fives from O'Fallon, Missouri. Woo -hoo! Oh, yeah. All right, guys. And then we've got Mr. Richards, grade six, sevens from Amherst View, Ontario. If you guys can. Yeah. <laughs> Of course, the reason you guys are all here today is for our speaker. We're joined live by David Makepeace, who has taken a lifelong passion with eclipses and really run wild with it. You've seen 23, ecl 23 eclipses in 15 countries on all seven continents, which is just mind-blowing. So without further ado, I'm going to let him share why eclipses are so cool, why he's pursued them all over the world, and why he's here with us today. Thank you so much for joining us, David. Thank you very much for having me. I'm very happy to be here. And hi to everybody who's watching. That's right. I'm an eclipse chaser. I've been chasing eclipses for most of my life now. And um, I think we should get straight into why eclipse chasing is so cool, especially since so many of us saw a total eclipse of the sun this past August. Uh, it's pretty rare when these things come along. But the uh, middle of North America saw a total eclipse of the sun in August, and millions of people saw their first total eclipse of the sun this year. And that was terrific for those of us who have been doing it for many years. So I want to get straight into why these things are so cool, show you guys some great videos, uh, some great pictures uh, that help explain some of the space science behind eclipses. So that's what we're talking about this week, is exploring space, why space is so cool, and maybe realize uh, some things that we'd never really thought about before. And eclipses are a terrific way uh, to start thinking about space and understanding how space works. So I'm going to share my screen. And let's get into some really uh, cool pictures of uh, some of this stuff. Now, hopefully, you guys can see this picture. Yep, all good. So here's a total eclipse of the sun. This was taken in Australia in 2002. You can see over here, my friends are standing watching the eclipse. We flew into the outback, into the desert to see this. And it's just one of the most tremendous pictures of a total eclipse. It's one of my favorites. And you can see here, there's the moon right in front of the sun, blocking the sun out, showing the corona, which is the atmosphere of the sun, which is the only thing that's left of the sun during a total eclipse. And if you look really carefully, you can actually see the shadow of the moon touching down on Earth here. See this dark part? That's the shadow of the moon that's shooting off the sun and touching the Earth. And when you're chasing eclipses, that's what you want to do is get inside the shadow of the moon. So let's look a little bit about how these eclipses happen in the first place. So a total eclipse of the sun happens when the moon moves directly in front of the sun, blocking it out completely. You can see it here in this terrific animation from NASA. So right here, I'm going to stop this animation for a moment. This is a total eclipse of the sun. This shows you exactly what is happening with the orbits in space in our solar system for a total solar eclipse to happen. You've got the moon that's just moving along normally in its orbit, except on this day, it happens to cross exactly in the right part of the sky to cover up the sun completely. When it does that, if you're standing in the right place where you can see this in the sky, you get to see the atmosphere of the sun suddenly come into view. And that's all these crazy streamers that you see on the outside of the moon here. All of these brushes shapes and these long streamers. You never know exactly what shape 
the corona is going to take when you see an eclipse. It's one of the most exciting things about seeing a total eclipse is that you never know what shape the corona is going to be in. So that gives you just the basic idea. It's the moon, I'm gonna just move this back. It's the moon moving along in its orbit and coming to the place where the sun is in the sky and blocking out the sun completely. This is when it goes dark. You can see planets and stars appearing in the sky. And then you have a total eclipse for maybe just a couple of minutes. And then the moon just keeps going and going and going. And then the eclipse is over when the sun comes back. So I've been all around the world to see this event. It's very difficult to just look at a picture or a video and understand how exciting it is to actually see the solar system working over your head. But it does deliver some tremendous pictures. And Eclipse Chasers, there's thousands of us all over the world. We love taking pictures of these events. And here's just a couple of them showing you um, how exciting and how dynamic some of these pictures can actually be. There's the moon in front of the sun. Here's a shot that I took in uh, uh, Argentina in 2010. And it, this is a tremendous shot of the shadow of the moon, if you can see this. This dark part in the sky that looks like a, a, a big cloud um, or big dark part, that's the shadow shooting off the surface of the moon, which is right there, that dark spot in the middle. And it's covering up the sun and its shadow is reaching out into space and touching the earth. And this little bottom part right here that's touching the earth, that's where we're standing allowing us to photograph this alignment between us and the moon and the sun. And if you look closely, I don't know if you can see it from your class, stars and planets are visible in the sky. That's how dark it gets. Here's a close-up of this eclipse. This is a, just above the Andes Mountains with the moon and the sun together, just about to set at the end of the day. And here's that diamond ring effect, what they call the diamond ring. This is a huge flash of light that comes shooting out from behind the dark side of the moon as the moon moves off. As it continues in its orbit, of course, the sun always comes back. And it's a gigantic flash of light. That's very exciting to see with your own eyes if you happen to be there. Now, eclipse chasers have been chasing for uh, decades and decades, even hundreds of years. People have been uh, able to understand uh, where eclipses were going to happen, and they've positioned themselves precisely um, on the surface of the Earth so that you can see an eclipse. So people have been doing this for years, and with all the great uh, cameras we have in the last number of years, we've got terrific photographs. So here's a total eclipse of the sun above the great statues, or the Mohai, of Easter Island. Can you imagine being there and seeing that for yourself, when all of a sudden, in the middle of the day, it goes dark? And then you look up into the sky, and you see this, the moon, completely blocking out the sun, allowing you to see the atmosphere of the sun or the corona that we were just talking about. This corona, all of these wispy white tendrils and these streamers, that's there every single day of our lives. But you can't see it because the sun is just so bright, you cannot see the atmosphere. Only when the moon moves in front are we able to see it. Look at the extent of the corona in this picture. Now this is a um, a combination of a number of different photographs with a really long exposure so you can see the outer parts of the corona here, way out here, very dim, and then really short exposures that give you the hot white parts on the middle here. But it shows you the extent of the corona in the sky. And if you were able to watch an eclipse for a half an hour, your eyes would adjust so much that you would see this in the sky. Here's a terrific photo again of how different the corona can look at different types of eclipses at, in, um, at different places around the world on different years. And you never know what you're going to get, which is one of the exciting things about showing up. Here is some uh, photographs that have been stitched together uh, from the eclipse that was just seen by millions of people in America this year. These photographs were taken by renowned astrophotographer Andreas Gada, who lives in Toronto or in Canada, not far from where I live. And I'm going to show you now, as he takes further and further long exposures, opening up the extent of the corona so that we can see exactly what the corona looked like. And as I move deeper and deeper into this animation and stop right about there, that's what the corona looked like in the sky in America this year. You've got all of these irregular streamers shooting off in different directions. Uh, to look up into the sky and see this, um, it, it is absolutely life-changing. 
This is unlike anything you've ever seen in the sky before, and it makes you realize that you live in the solar system, that you're part of these tremendous forces that are wheeling above your head every day of your life. And then, of course, towards the end of the eclipse, there you go, and then the moon starts to move off again, and then the moon just keeps going, and then the sun comes back out. So, it's a very dynamic event, chasing eclipses, and I've been lucky enough to go all around the world over the last number of years to see these things because I love filming them, but I also love seeing them. So it's a job to a certain extent, but it's also really my passion, my hobby. I love being able to film them and show people what it was that we saw. I've been to Antarctica a number of years ago to see an eclipse. In fact, we were the first people in human history to see an eclipse from Antarctica. You can see all the penguins that we had here. There was over 80,000 pairs of penguins at that location. Here's me looking like I'm having a pretty good time uh, in Arizona a couple of years ago. And you can see all of our equipment with the special filters so that we can shoot the partial phases of the eclipse when the sun is still visible. Of course, when the total eclipse comes, you can take all of the filters off and you can look at the eclipse with your naked eye. Here's a great picture of me also having a great time in Indonesia just last year in 2016. So I've been everywhere to see these things. It's really exciting to see the corona and the action of the shadow of the moon racing across the earth at all these different locations, including here in Libya in 2006. Here I am standing at a real oasis um, one of the uh, very few sources of water that um, you can ever find out in the Sahara. So for me, this really all got going with a really um, a, a sense of the moon that I was really fascinated with. And uh, when I was a kid, I was never into eclipse chasing, but I did love the moon. And I think it was the first thing that really got me interested in space and in space exploration and what was really going on um, outside of the Earth's atmosphere because the moon is so mysterious. I'm sure all of you have seen the moon at one point or another rising or setting and then on different days you see it looks like a different phase and then it's really thin one day and then it's really fat another day and then a couple of days later you get a full moon. I find the moon to be probably the most magical thing about the Earth. And when we start talking about space exploration or wanting to understand space that we live in, the moon is probably one of the first things that you can go to because it is so mysterious and it belongs to the earth. It's our nearest celestial neighbor. And when you see it doing things like this, when you see a moonrise where it seems to be supernatural, it can have a great effect on you. And it certainly did for me. So this is a terrific uh, film taken by Luke Taylor from Australia. And this is a real uh, image. This is not a trick and this is not a composite. Um, he's just a terrific photographer with a long lens who was able to position himself perfectly to get this tremendous uh, video of the moon rising. So this just gives you a, an example of how magical the moon is as it moves in its orbit. And I think one of the things that we need to come to terms with when we start talking about eclipses is the moon. Because when I talk to people, most people actually don't know much about the moon, why it moves the way that it does, and why we see the different phases of the moon that we do see all month long. And I think if you look at this film, you can see that you'll recognize each of the different phases of the moon that you can see throughout the month. Because we, as we know, the moon does go around the Earth once a month, once every 29 and a half days. And if you're really interested in space, the moon is such a terrific place to start because it's so close to us. It's essentially uh, our neighbor. And if you uh, start looking at the moon, tracking its motions, trying to get a sense of where it is, it's very easy to find out uh, using the internet these days uh, where the moon is going to rise, where it's going to set. And I think you'll recognize when you see this film here, all the different phases of the moon that it's possible to see. But why do we see this? It looks like when you see this film that the moon is going through this tremendous transformation all the time. Every night, night after night, it's doing something different. And that is what it looks like. But I think if you take a look at this next film, you'll understand that the moon is actually doing something quite different. 
but we know that the moon goes around the earth once a month but why do we see all those phases that we see well here's the trick so the next time that you look up at the moon i want you to remember what we've talked about here today and the real trick with the moon and why we see the phases is that the moon is actually full all the time the fact that we see all the different phases is a bit of an illusion because of where we're standing down here on the earth if you watch this animation of the moon going around you'll notice here's the moon here look at it it's not going through all of those neat phases that we just saw is it no it's not in fact the moon pretty much looks full the entire time that it's going around the earth once a month it's not going through all of those changes in fact you can see that half of it is lit and half of it is dark so the part that's facing the sun over this way it's always half lit and the part that's behind that's facing away from the sun it's always half dark so that's the truth about the moon. The reason that we see the phases that we see is that when we're standing here on Earth, the position has changed. The aspect that we're, of the moon that we're seeing has changed because it's rotating all the way around the Earth. So the trick to understanding the moon and all the moon's phases is realizing that what I'm seeing um, about the moon at any moment is uh, largely a fact of where the moon is. Is it in front? of the earth as it is right here or is it moving over towards beside the earth like it's moving here right now or is the moon behind us so is the moon in front to the side or behind us that gives you all the different phases that you see so if we start off a cycle of the moon here and let's say we stop there one day and you look up and you see the moon that's this phase that you're seeing right over here see this crescent we're all familiar with that crescent that's because the moon the half lit part of the moon has moved over just enough so you can see a tiny little bit of it over here as the moon continues to move in its orbit let's say over to there now you're starting to see this phase because you're looking up from the earth and you're looking over at half of the lit part and of course it's still dark in the back so you're seeing this type of a of a, of a lunar phase where it looks half lit and half dark so the moon is not actually going through all those changes it just looks like it is from our position now as the moon moves completely behind the earth you've got a full moon just like this because now you can look up from earth and you're seeing the entire lit half that's why it's a full moon then the moon of course it keeps going throughout the month and then when the moon gets beside the earth again you can look up and you can see this it's a quarter moon, just like the other one, but you're seeing it from the other side. Now it's dark back here, and the lit half is all here, and you're seeing a line down the middle. When the moon keeps going throughout the month, of course, and it gets to another uh, crescent phase, you're seeing this type of a crescent. Now most of the lit half is actually facing away from the Earth. That's why you can't see it, and you're looking up from the Earth into the dark part. So this is why we see the phases that we see. And it's the moon going round and around and around the Earth once a month that's also responsible for creating solar eclipses. So let's take a look at why we don't get eclipses every single month if the moon is always going around the Earth. So watch this animation. Take a look at what it is that we're actually seeing here as the moon goes around the Earth. You're seeing that the moon has a long shadow that comes off it. The sun's way over here somewhere. And here's the Earth, and the Earth also has a long shadow. So any spherical objects that you put out into space, they will have a light part and a dark part. <clears throat> of course, this is called daytime, and this is called night. And with the moon, you've got a day and a nighttime part as well, and these long shadows that are out in space all the time. So as the moon moves around, we're going to come to, <clears throat> come to a side view. Most of the time when the moon is moving in its orbit, you'll see that its shadow falls far north of the actual Earth. And the shadow doesn't touch the Earth because the moon is too high. And as the moon keeps moving in its orbit, it'll go down a little bit. And the next month when the moon comes along, the moon will be too low for its shadow to actually cross the surface of the Earth. This is why we're not having an eclipse right now, because the shadow is falling way away from the Earth. It's only at this very special time when the moon, moving along in its orbit, comes to this red line. This is this perfect lineup right here. 
<clears throat> where the moon is in the perfect position to cause an eclipse of the sun. So with the sun way over here and the moon in the right position, look at its shadow. The shadow drops right down on top of the surface of the earth and this allows us to come running along and stand there. And that's how we see a total eclipse of the sun because the earth and the sun and the moon have lined up perfectly along this red line. This is what gives us the opportunity to go see a total eclipse of the sun. So now let's get into some of the space science. It's all about the shadow of the moon that you can see here. So we know now that the uh, moon and the earth and the sun are in perfect alignment. Um, this is not to scale. This is just showing you what the dynamics of the shadow actually is. At the end of the video, you'll see the real scale. But you can see that the earth is here and here's the moon and it's blocking out the sun and you can see the shadow falling down onto the surface of the earth so that we can run in and stand there and see. So look at this tremendous animation from NASA. As the moon is moving along in its orbit, and it's in this perfect alignment, it drops this long cone of shadow all the way down onto the Earth. You can even see the Earth's shadow going off into infinity into the distance here. But this is the really cool action that causes a total eclipse of the Sun. When the Moon gets into the right position and its shadow falls across the surface of the Earth, this is the rare event of the total eclipse. So what the Moon is doing is just regular moving along in its orbit, but because of the alignment, now the shadow falls on the Earth and it creates the path of totality. This is where you need to stand if you want to see a total eclipse. It's somewhere inside this, this path as the moon moves along. You can't see a total eclipse anywhere out here or anywhere down here. If you want to see the moon completely block out the sun, you have to stand in this tiny little dot of moon shadow as it comes racing along. And then this, this animation will show you where you need to stand if you wanted to see the eclipse back in August that came through the middle of North America. And of course, the shadow will keep moving across the Earth, whether anybody is there or not. I don't know if anybody saw this eclipse out here in the ocean. I think most people came to, to stand um, um, on the surface of the Earth in America. But there is the real scale. So if the moon was this big, and the Earth was this big. This is the real distance between the two of them. Look how incredibly long and thin the shadow of the moon is. Look how far it has to travel to actually touch the surface. And by the time it does touch the surface, it's like a needle. It is so small and it's so thin. By the time it hits the Earth, it's only about 70 or maybe 80 miles wide. And you have to understand using science where that shadow is going to be so that you can go and stand in it and stand inside this shadow of the moon which will then block out the sun completely so i'm just going to roll this back just a little bit to show you the action of the shadow moving across the surface of the earth again in this animation because it's really something that you need to understand um, when it comes to the shadow because the shadow is everything so here's the shadow again, scraping its path across the earth. If you're lucky enough to know where to stand, you could stand right there and then, oh, boom, you'd see a total eclipse in there. And that would only last maybe a couple of minutes. And then the moon shadow just keeps on moving. So this is how dynamic solar eclipses are. And um, it's one of the reasons that they're really exciting to chase because you're actually getting involved in the solar system. If math and science didn't show us this, we would never understand where we had to be. But with all the precise measurements that we have, um, it gives us this uh, a tremendous opportunity to participate uh, in the solar system the way that we do when we're seeing a total eclipse of the sun. So let's get into some real pictures. Look at this satellite image that was taken of the eclipse that uh, just happened in August. Um, and they put this camera on a satellite out in space to capture the shadow of the moon actually racing across the globe. So do you see that big black blotch? That's the shadow of the moon that we were just watching in the animation. So it's amazing to see how the prediction will tell you where you need to be and the predictions from science will tell you where you need to stand and exactly what the solar system will do and it does do that. It's incredible that we know so much about the solar system to enable us to uh, make a prediction 
and then go stand in the right place and then observe that that um, phenomenon actually did occur. So as I say, this is one of the most exciting things about chasing solar eclipses and actually being involved in space at all is that you're actually involving yourself uh, in the solar system. Um, there's nothing else like it. So this path that you have to get into to see a total eclipse, it's very important for eclipse chasers because we really need to know where to stand. And once we understand where the, the shadow is going to fall, we can make very, very precise measurements on the earth and create animations and maps like this that show you exactly where you need to be. And NASA creates these from all kinds of really complicated data that shows you where the shadow of the moon will fall and it tells you what cities you would need to be in if you wanted to see the total eclipse. So maps like this were used by millions of people back in August to help them understand where they needed to be. And it also expresses the fact that if you stand out here somewhere or anywhere out here outside the shadow, you'll only see a partial eclipse and you will not see uh, a total eclipse. So with this kind of really neat animation that you can move back and forth, you can say that, oh, if I went to stand in this town here called Greenwood, then yes, I'll see a total eclipse. But if I wanted to stand out here in Charlotte, no, there's no total eclipse there. So you can't go there. If you want to see the total eclipse, you need to be inside the shadow of the moon. So a lot of the great science and a lot of the great space science has allowed us to make very, very um, precise predictions because at this point in human history, we understand the motions of the moon and the planets extremely well. And it's allowed us to actually take it outside of science and make it something really fun that you can do. Because believe me, there's nothing more incredible than seeing a total eclipse of the sun when you look up into the sky and you see that incredible uh, vision. Now, this type of... Uh, experience is so compelling i haven't been able to stop traveling here's a little google earth to give you a sense of all these different shadow paths um, that have been created across the earth over the last 25 years or so uh, that show me where i need to be so i've been to all of these eclipses there's the one that we just saw in north america i've been down into mexico to see these shadow paths it's all about the shadow went through the middle of South America, and here's one way down here, right at the tip of South America. I saw that one. And as we cross the uh, Atlantic Ocean over here into Africa, I've been there a couple of times. This is the Sahara Desert. I saw a total eclipse there in 2006. I also saw one that crossed the bottom of South Africa down here. And check this out. This is Antarctica. It's very rare to see an eclipse in Antarctica, but we were amongst the first humans to ever see a total eclipse right on this coast over here. Traveling the rest of the planet, I've been to Australia a couple of times. It's amazing that the predictions of the solar system can be so accurate that they tell you exactly where you need to stand. I've been to China a couple of times, India. Look at the shadow paths just crossing the earth. Middle East, I was in the Middle East once. And here's a, a, a really interesting eclipse up here towards the North Pole. In 2015, this eclipse here hardly touched any land at all. The path of the eclipse was seen on land only from a couple of those um, Antarctic, or sorry, Arctic islands up here, Svalbard, and all the rest of it was ocean. So it was very difficult to chase this eclipse because there was nowhere to stand. So what a number of us did uh, was get together and we chartered a plane so that we could fly uh, into the path of totality um, from, and see it actually from a plane. So this is what the shadow path looked like on the day that we just saw. There's the little black blotch. That's where you can see a total eclipse. So this part on the, uh, on the map shows you where the total eclipse would be moving. So we knew exactly what the path was going to be. So we took a plane from Europe over here and we flew into that part of the North Sea and here's what that video looked like. If you take a look at this from my camera position outside the, uh, the window, here's the wing of the plane, and look how dark it is behind here. This is the shadow of the moon racing up from behind us. And if you watch closely right along here in this part of the film, that's the advancing edge of the moon's shadow. And watch. There's a total eclipse. 
look at the advancing edge of the shadow of the moon racing across the earth and you can see the cone of shadow in the sky here. There's the moon blocking out the sun and we're flying inside the shadow of the moon. Here's the fast forward version. Look at the action of the shadow. So <clears throat> this is just tremendously exciting to be up on a plane and basically flying through space and noticing that you're in space along with all of these other space objects and that you're on a space object as well. Earth is a space object and all of us uh, exist in space as well. So just an incredible uh, opportunity to be able to get up into uh, you know, 35,000 feet and have the shadow of the moon uh, fall down on top of you. I love filming the action of the shadow. I've been to all these eclipses to film them and the thing that I'm interested the most is this. Watch the shadow. That's the shadow of the moon engulfing you during a total eclipse of the sun. Here we go again. The shadow comes racing in, blocks out the sun, and turns daytime into night in a matter of seconds. This is probably one of my favorite gifts from China in 2008. Because the sweeping in of the shadow just gives you chills. And you can imagine what it would be like for you to actually stand there yourself while the shadow of the moon comes in. It's absolutely incredible. So you know I love filming these things. So here's a couple of uh, clips from a film that I made from Indonesia. Uh, back in 2016. This shows you where the shadow is about to fall and that we're standing on a tiny little Indonesian island right there. And here comes the shadow of the moon. Watch. Look at the shadow racing in. Here it is again. Watch the sun as it gets blocked by the moon. Watch the sun. Look at that. Watch this again. Watch the shadow move across these clouds and then darken the horizon a second later. Isn't that amazing? That's the action of the shadow. The eclipse is really a cosmic light switch. It turns the lights out. It goes daytime into night in a matter of seconds. And here's a really interesting angle. This is one of the cameras that I put up to hopefully capture this effect. And you see this line in the sky, that's the advancing edge of the shadow of the moon. You see over on this side how dark it is, and it's still light on this side. That's because the eclipse is only just coming in following the leading edge of the moon's shadow here. So you can see that there's a total eclipse on this side, but over here, it's not quite a total eclipse yet until the next couple of seconds unfolds. Now the shadow of the moon is moving more and more and more through the sky this way and engulfing us in this terrific, um, really exciting experience of totality. So here's one of the other cameras that I put up for this eclipse. The moon is moving this way and we're almost totally covering up the sun. These are the last few moments of what they call the diamond ring, where the moon is completely covering the sun. See, now a total eclipse has begun and there's no sun at all. There's me having an amazing time. There's the incredible sky of the corona. Up here in the sky, all the amazing colors that you see. And here's the terrific close-up shot of the corona that I was able to get in Indonesia at this eclipse. It's just so stunning to be able to stand there and look up at how beautiful the sky is. You see this orange glow on the horizon everywhere. And then the detail that I was able to get from this shot in the corona uh, just made me really happy. This is detail. Right down here, you see all those uh, tendrils and the streamers shooting off from the surface of the sun that you normally would never see. And look at me using binoculars here. You can look straight at that when the total eclipse is, uh, is happening. So extremely dynamic event. It's probably one of the most exciting events that, um, that you could possibly see. Just a beautiful sky when you're standing in the shadow of the moon. It's like no other experience on Earth. It really is. And then when the eclipse starts to end, the shadow of the moon starts to move away and it gets brighter. And then look, the shadow rushes away. Watch this again of the shadow moving off. And then the eclipse comes to an end. And then, of course, when the moon moves off, you get a diamond ring again. There's the diamond ring, that flash of really bright light of the sun returning. And then look at the picture of me. All the light is returned to my face once again. And then the moon slowly moves off. 
And then in, at this eclipse, I was able to film some of the most um, uh, interesting shots after the eclipse as it came through the trees. You'll see this shot in a second where the palm trees are gently brushing up against the eclipse as the moon moves off. These are probably some of my favorite shots right here. I don't know if anything like this has ever been filmed before where you can actually still see the black disc of the moon long after the sun has come back and the trees moving back and forth are helping the camera see that. And those are just great shots. So it's extremely exciting to be able to, uh, uh, to see something like this. And um, it's really helped me understand that, um, you know, we live in the solar system. Um, being able to run around the world and see these celestial events has made me realize that as we explore space, we're actually exploring the place that we live. Because of course we live in space. And uh, let's turn the sound off on that. That this is actually our home here. So if, if we all live to be 100 years old, we're gonna go around the sun a hundred times. That's what we'll do. And as we explore space and try to understand what's happening far, far away out in the universe, I think what we're actually doing is we're discovering ourselves because we live in space as well. We're not separate from any of these elements. We're actually the same as these elements. All of us are going to spend all of our lives on this planet, going around the sun and sharing all this space with the other planets. And as we explore space, I think we discover ourselves, that's the most uh, important thing that I've learned, is that uh, we belong to the Earth and we belong to space. And that's what I wanted to say about that. So, if you're interested in seeing the whole movie of, of the bits that I showed you from Indonesia and the, uh, the um, uh, other elements about how eclipses work, there's a great film here called Still Hooked which is available on my website here at eclipseguy.com. Uh, you're welcome to uh, uh, visit the website and check that out. And if you're really interested uh, in eclipses and exploring more of your interest in space, there is another eclipse coming up. It's not for seven years. <laughs> so if you can wait for a little while, you can see another total eclipse of the sun. And here is where it's going to be. And it comes right through North America again. So this yellow path, that you're seeing here is the path of the total eclipse. That's where the shadow will fall. So it's very easy to put yourself inside the path of the shadow if you wanna see this event in 2024. It comes right up through Mexico, through the middle of the States, and then lucky enough for people in Canada, uh, it moves right into the Eastern part of, uh, of New Brunswick and across Prince Edward Island. And it just scoots by my house right here in Toronto. I don't get 100% eclipse, I get 99.9. .9. So if I go out onto my lawn, I'm not going to see a total eclipse. I'll see almost a total eclipse. So I still need to travel for this one. And I haven't decided where I'm going to go, but I might go down here to Mexico or Texas where the uh, weather is going to be uh, uh, in great shape for the eclipse because weather's, a, weather's really important. So I hope some of you will actually get down there and, uh, and see the eclipse in, in 2024. Awesome. Thank you so much, David. Uh, all right, so let's head straight to questions. That was marvelous. Uh, let's start with Mrs. McCrell's class. If you guys have a question, uh, come on up. Um, um, does like the clips go like straight across America or like does it go in one? Um, yeah, it, it, the path will cover America from Mexico and it'll come up the eastern part of America and then go off into Canada. So there's all kinds of places that you could stand if you wanted to see the eclipse. Yeah, there's thousands of places that you could go. Yeah, okay. very easy to see this eclipse. All right, uh, Mr. Jenkins class, do you guys have a question? Hey. 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 Can we have a question for him? Can I go? Uh, I'll say go ahead. Okay, so how are the holes on the, on the moon formed? Can you say that again? <laughs> oh, yeah, let's do it again. Okay, wow. So how are the um, holes on the moon formed? 
Oh, you mean the crater? Yeah, the crater. Oh, yeah. The craters, uh, they're a feature on the moon that have been there for billions of years from back in the early days when the moon was formed and there was all kinds of dust and rocks and asteroids and meteors that were slamming into the surface of the moon and it gave it sort of a pockmarked type of surface. And a lot of those features have been there for years. Sorry, David, was that all? Uh, yep. I want guys to keep your mic muted just for a second. Thanks, guys. All right. David, was that the end of the answer? Sorry. Yes. Perfect. Okay. If, if they heard it. Yes, we did hear it. Okay. All right. Let's go to Mrs. Dyson's class. We'll get to you guys, Isaac, Ron, in just a second, okay? All right. Okay. Oh, which was your favorite eclipse to watch? Oh, uh, that's a really good question. Uh, they're all amazing, um, but probably my favorite one is always the last one that I saw. So the one in America that we just saw in August, that's my favorite one right now until I see the next one. But they're all amazing. You can't pick. Good problem to have. Uh, all right. Now, Isaac Brock, if you guys want to come up and demute your mic, uh, yeah, you can ask your question. Any questions? There you go. Okay. Okay, I'll just quickly note for you guys, your class is too loud, so if you want to ask a question, there's a little chat bar in the top left. It's a little blue square. You can ask a question there. Just type it in, and I'll pass it along, okay? Uh, in the meantime, Mr. Richard's class, if you guys have a question, come on up. Yep, you're good. So when you want them to speak, oh, so, so they can hear you. So Mr. Richard, why do you have to protect? Why do you have to protect your ass when you clip? That's a good question. Okay, that was a good very that's a good question. So the question was, why do you have to protect your eyes during an eclipse? So the eclipse only brings an opportunity to look up towards the sun because the moon is there. That's why you need to wear some eye protection. The eclipse doesn't bring anything that's dangerous. It's only you can't look at the sun any day. If you take a glance at the sun, you can only look for maybe one second or two seconds before your natural impulse is to look away. And that's normal, and that's the way that it should be. But when the moon starts to move across the sun, it gives you a reason to want to look for longer. That's when you need to put on very special glasses so that you don't hurt your eyes when you look directly at the sun. So the eclipse itself doesn't bring anything that's dangerous. It's just that you cannot look at the sun for extended periods of time without eye protection. Excellent. Glad we got that question. All right, before we go back to the classes, uh, we've got a group, uh, the Valley Senior Public School, Mr. Young's class has been like watching all our, our hangouts online on YouTube Live. So a question from their class is, what type of equipment do you use to document all this? Um, really cool cameras. Um, depending on what your interest is with chasing eclipses, you can bring those really big telescopes and you can get amazingly tight shots, good close-up shots of all the cool stuff going on the surface of the sun or detail in the solar corona. Um, and a lot of people do that. A lot of people bring just regular cameras with a bit of a zoom lens so they can get a nice close-up shot of the eclipse in the sky. Other people are really interested in wide angle photography. So they'll bring a really short wide angle lens so that you can see the landscape and the sky and then the eclipse as a little dot up there in the sky. I like doing all of those things, but because I make films, um, most of the equipment that I bring is not so much telescopic equipment, but film equipment uh, with different kinds of lenses attached to them. So as that, uh, that film showed you uh, towards the end of the talk there from Indonesia, I had five cameras, five film cameras going, all shooting different aspects. There's one on me, a close up in the sky, there's a bunch of wide angles, and then I cut those all together into a film. So you can take whatever equipment to an eclipse that you need, depending on what it is that you want to do. Excellent, all right. So we're gonna try Isaac Brock again, guys. If you guys can keep quiet in the background, then come on up and ask your question. <laughs> You're good, yep. Okay. 
All right. So I'll just pass on the chat information in a minute to you guys. Uh, let's go back to Mr. Jenkins' class. Hey. I, 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 right over here. Right. Uh, I was going to ask, why is there not um, a lot of solar eclipses in Antarctica as much in different places? Um, that is a really, really good question. So uh, because of the way that the moon moves in its orbit, it is mostly central around the central part of the uh, equator of the Earth. It does move up and down, as we saw, because sometimes it's so high the shadow misses, and most of the other times it's so low that the shadow misses the bottom of the Earth. So it's that very specific point where the shadow falls just across the South Pole or the North Pole. Those are more rare, those eclipses, because those points are very small. If you take a look at the Earth as a whole, as a globe, there's much more surface area towards the central part of the globe of the Earth. So it's easier for the shadow of the moon to hit those parts than it is the tiny little parts around the top of the North Pole or the South Pole. Excellent. All right. Uh, let's go back to Mrs. Dyson's class. Uh, yep, you're good. Except the mic is off. Why is the mic off? We're going to figure it out, David. We're going to have some fun. All right. Go ahead and try it. Yep, you're good. Why can you only see the same side of the moon? Uh, that's also a really terrific question. So um, the moon is tidally locked towards the, um, the uh, direction of the Earth. So what that means is, is that uh, the, the moon is actually spinning on its axis, but it's also rotating around the Earth at the same rate. So this, this is a little bit of a difficult uh, uh, science idea to understand, but it's sort of locked in place so that as it moves around the Earth, it doesn't turn like this. The face is always towards the Earth. So as it moves, the, 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 the face of the moon always stays facing down towards the Earth. That's called tidally locked. It's locked like a tide has locked it, almost like a magnet, has locked that side of the, the face of the moon towards the Earth so that it doesn't spin in any unpredictable ways. It's locked and it moves. Uh, it's really a dance between the Earth and the moon. They're very much uh, related to each other in terms of how they behave and they're locked in a position like that so that the moon doesn't spin independently, allowing you to see the other side. You always see that one side. That's a very, um, that's a very difficult uh, uh, planetary uh, uh, concept to understand how that happens. But the net effect is that uh, because of that tidal lock, uh, it never spins independently on its own. You always see the same side. Excellent. All right. Uh, last note for Isaac Brock, there's a chat bar top left of your screen, a little blue square. If you guys can type a question there, I can pass it along to David. Uh, in the meantime, let's go to Mr. Richard's class. You guys have a question? Sure, yeah. <clears throat> yep. um, did you have to take a certain like school to do the like running around and chasing the eclipse? Uh, that's a really good question, too. And the answer in my case is no. Um, I studied some of the, the, the basic uh, astronomy that was offered to me um, in my public school and then the rest of what I learned, I learned by myself by going out into the world and getting my pants dirty. Uh, and this is probably one of the best ways that we can learn stuff is actually going out and experiencing it for yourself. So the science and the mathematics that you see in a textbook or on the page are very important so that you understand the concepts of what's happening with Earth and what's happening with space, but you can learn far more by going out into the world and observing and experiencing on your own. And that's my story. It's been really great over all of Space Week, actually. We've had people that you know wanted to be an astronaut since they were a really little kid and they just kept doing that. And then we've had people that were in a completely different field. We've had models that became you know mechatronics engineers. We've had people like you who just followed a passion and, and learned it yourself. So it's been really nice to see. Uh, David, do you have time for three more questions? Excellent. Absolutely. All right, let's go to Mr. Jenkins' class again. Can you guys hear me still? <laughs> we wrote one in, so I can pass that along. Uh, so Mr. Jenkins' class wanted to ask, how long have you been chasing eclipses? I've been chasing eclipses now for 26 years. 
I saw my first eclipse in Mexico in 1991, sort of by accident. I was there to visit a friend of mine, and I knew the eclipse was coming, but it wasn't my main focus. Um, and then as soon as the eclipse was over, it became my main focus because it was the best thing that I had ever seen in my life. And then I spent the last 26 years trying to get back into the path of totality. Outstanding. Uh, all right, Mrs. Dykes class. You guys have a final question. Come on in. All good, yeah? Hello? No? I don't know. We'll come back to you guys in just a second. We're having some trouble with getting questions in today. Mr. Richards' class, you guys have a question? Uh, we're good. They actually had to go out for, for recess. Oh, so I, just, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much. Have a nice day. Yeah, thank you. All right. Uh, so Mrs. Dykes' class, if you guys have another question, we can wrap it up with that. No, not coming through. All right, David, we'll wrap it up there. We've got a bunch of good questions in. Uh, what we do at the end of every hangout is I'm going to demute everyone's mic. We've got a few classes left. If you guys will join me in saying a big thank you to, uh, to David. So thank you, David. Thank you. Thank you. Marvelous. Thanks for joining us. Happy Space Week, everybody. And the classes will join us. We'll be back soon. Have a lovely rest of your day.